Okay, our third finalist in bridge category is from Majeski and Masters uh, for the Huey P. Long Bridge Widening. Uh, presenting will be Bruce Peterson, Senior Associate and Project Manager. This is a uh, $1.2 billion uh, Huey P. Long Bridge Widening Project in New Orleans, Louisiana. And we'll have three 11 foot lanes in each direction that feature 8 foot outside and 2 foot inside shoulders. Previously, the bridge had two narrow 9 foot lanes in each direction to railroad tracks. Uh, these new approaches and interchanges include continuous steel pre-stressed girder spans, ramps connecting the main steel structure. With that, I'll turn it over to Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Thank, thank you. Good morning. My presentation today is on the widening of the Huey P. Long Bridge. This is a summary of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to begin first with a little background on the, the company, Majeski and Masters, on the bridge itself, project history. Then I'm going to go into the four main construction contracts. That's main bridge substructure widening, main bridge superstructure widening, railroad modifications, and the approaches. And I'm going to talk about the design challenges for most of these. And then I'm going to finish with uh, some photographs of the current construction. Now, Majeski and Masters was founded in 1893. It's named after its founder and its last partner, uh, Mr. Ralph Majeski and Frank Masters. We specialize in the design of bridges, all types, long, short, railroad, uh, highway, movable, fixed. Uh, we designed the original Huey P. Long Bridge, and we're about to celebrate our 120th year anniversary. And we've continually inspected the bridge since its original construction. We're considered a medium-sized consulting firm, and uh, I'm located in the New Orleans office where most of this design work was done. Now, the project is located just upriver from the city of New Orleans. And prior to the bridge, rail and highway traffic crossed the river using ferries. Now this limited the volume of traffic and was dangerous during bad weather and bad river conditions. In 1924, the New Orleans Public Belt Railroad engaged Ralph Majeski to design a bridge to replace the ferries. The design was a cantilever truss with a main span of 790 feet and a vertical clearance for marine navigation of 135 feet. Now the thing to keep in mind is at the time this bridge was built, many people felt you couldn't build a structure of this type on the soils in the region. Uh, as, while originally conceived as strictly a railroad bridge, the state of Louisiana participated in the cost of adding highway lanes to the bridge. However, the bridge remains owned by the New Orleans Public Belt Railroad, and there's a mutual agreement between the state and the railroad governing the spans and the lanes that are on it. It was completed in 1935 and at the time was the longest railroad bridge in the world from abutment to abutment. It provided two railroad tracks and two 18-foot roadways, each with two 9-foot lanes. It was, the original bridge was re recently named an ASCE National Historic Landmark. Now as it is a railroad bridge, it's heavily built and continues to carry modern freight railroad loads to this day. It has many more years of remaining service life. Current ADTs are up to 50,000 vehicles a day with projected traffic is going to, in the next 20 years of 70,000. The state recognizing the need to have additional traffic capacity across the river was looking at various locations where a new span could be used and placed. However, by 1982, the public could not agree on the location for a new span. They agreed they needed one, but just not where to put it. So in 1986, the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development authorized Majeski and Masters to study widening the existing bridge. Now this was felt to be advantageous by reducing environmental impacts and reducing right-of-way takings and thus reducing costs. The study concluded that a parallel truss widening was the most practical alternative. Now this slide summarizes in, in, in very briefly the pro main project goals. First, to design a widening for the main bridge superstructure. Second, design new approaches that would have more lanes going up to the widened structure and also would uh, improve traffic flow. The existing bridge had a traffic circle on one end and the remnants of a traffic circle on the other end who by that point in time through many modifications the most charitable description uh, for the intersection would be to call it atypical. Uh, and the, finally, the main, one of the main project goals on the main span was to maintain traffic during construction. That's all, that's marine, highway, and rail. Here are the elements of the uh, project. We have first the main bridge 
substructure widening and superstructure widening. We have the approaches on the West Bank and East Bank, and as part of that work is the West Bank, uh, the uh, main bridge deck widening. And then finally, the two railroad modifications in the East and West Bank. Now, it's the railroad modifications. I'm not going to go into detail on the design challenges, but to explain its need, on the main bridge, you have the East Bank and West Bank bound traffic straddling the railroad tracks. However, on the East Bank side, both directions are on the upstream side, and on the West Bank side, they're both on the downstream side. Consequently, on each side, one of the directions has to pass through the railroad trestle, and that was the need for those modifications. Beginning with the design challenges for the main bridge substructure widening, primarily was reuse of existing piers. No new piers would be placed in the water. Also, how to support the widened superstructure. Now, this work consisted of widening five main bridge piers. There's five in the river and one on land. The solution that we came up with was to uh, provide an encasement on the existing pier. You can see remnants of the existing pier right here. It begins at a distribution block located under the river. Uh, this portion of the encasement is 98 feet wide, and above this rubbing strip area is 80 feet, and it is uh, 97 feet tall from the distribution block. Then to support the widening trusses, we went for a steel frame because this would reduce weight and also provide a defined load path down into the foundation. It's 152 feet wide at the top, 75 feet at the bottom, and 53 feet tall. Now the existing foundations and soils were examined and found that they could support the additional load. Also the existing pier concrete was investigated and found that even at the time of the original construction, twice the capacity called for in the plans had been provided. For the main bridge superstructure widening, our challenges were to design a four-plane truss system. Nobody does this. There's some old references where you'll see some covered bridges that had multiple truss planes, but in modern construction, it's just not done. Maintenance of traffic, of which highway was the most difficult. And then finally, how do you erect two new structures, two widening trusses against an existing truss, and as you build them, not impose loads into the existing truss? Now this work consisted of widening the main bridge spans, which is a cantilever truss and through truss spans. These total approximately 2,370 feet in length. The original trusses are 33 foot on center, and they, they are cantilever floor beam brackets supporting the 18 foot roadways. The widened bridge would add two additional trusses approximately 51 feet off of the existing ones. There are 43 foot roadways, uh, on each side, uh, gutter to gutter, supporting three 11 foot lanes, a two foot shoulder offset on the left and an eight foot shoulder on the right. We used a 3D computer model to analyze this. Uh, a lot of this work was done in the, uh, well, preliminary work in the late 90s, final designs in the early 2000s, and there weren't moving load programs at that time, and particularly not for railroad loads. What we did was get infl multiple influence lines, as it is a three-dimensional structure. We modeled it totally in three dimensions, all the members, including the secondaries. And then we took, it's, as it is a three-dimensional structure, it really has an influence surface. Rather than analyze that, we took multiple influence lines. We ran unit loads down each of the truss planes, the quarter points of the uh, roadways, and down the center line of each railroad track. Got the influence lines from those for every single member, then on our different loading groups, proportionally applied them to the influence lines, totaled up and found the maximums for every single member, including secondaries. Now this is a slightly conservative uh, result, and I say slightly because it's not that, that significantly more, and so we were comfortable with this approximation. Now, using this three-dimensional model, we found that uh, the existing truss did not have to be strengthened, with the exception of some secondary members as a result of wind. Now, one thing to keep in mind that in the United States, the AREMA code is used for the design of railroad structures, and AASHTO is used for the design of highway structures. There's no code for a combined rail highway structure. So what we did was we took the live loads from each of these codes, and then we analyzed and designed every single member in the truss based on both codes. The other thing that neither code addresses is wind on multiple truss planes. What we did here is we took the AREMA code and uh, we sort of extended it for multiple truss planes. 
This shows the solution that we came up with for the uh, problem of maintenance of traffic for highways. It takes seven steps. The first three are part of the truss widening contract. The remainder are part of the deck widening contract. The key to the solution of maintaining traffic was the incorporation of the cantilever floor beam bracket into the final floor beam. This was done by adding a wedge fill, which created a constant depth section, a nice square face by which a floor beam extension could be added along with the widening truss. Then new roadway constructed, and then at a, a major event in the time frame of the project, traffic switched over to this new roadway, and that not only on the main bridge, but on some of the approaches. Old roadway removed, remainder constructed, and then we see the final configuration here in stage seven. Finally, the erection of the widening truss. Anytime you erect a, a structure, it isn't in its final vertical location until all dead load is placed. Normally, if you're doing new construction, like a cantilever truss, we have two truss planes, everything comes down at the same time. For the widening truss, it would not be down to its final vertical location until the deck was placed. If you were to erect this in the traditional manner, one single member at a time, you would and you braced it against the existing truss, as you erected, you would, and it deflected downward, it would drag the existing truss down with it. This isn't in the design, the existing truss can't, can't tolerate this. We came up with a way by which we could uh, have the, show in the plans a means by which it could be erected in the traditional manner that, that cantilever trusses are erected, and that is with false work in the anchor arm spans cantilevering out over the main span until the structure is finished. This was done with, um, we showed how it could be done with bent plates, slotted holes, and to offset, keep the size of the uh, gusset plates down, we went to A490 bolts because an A490 in a slotted hole is the same as an A25 in a, in a uniform hole. And by surcharging the widening truss, we could bring it down to where it's supposed to be. The secondary members could be rigidly bolted, and then uh, the construction could continue on. Now, recognizing that this construction was unique, different, we also gave the opportunity for the contractor to propose an alternative means of construction. And uh, we gave him the rules, and one of the big rules was you can't impose loads into the existing truss. Well, the contractor did take advantage of this, and this is what he proposed to do. He proposed to erect the west anchor arm, the uh, cantilever arms, in the traditional, if you will, stick build method. In other words, one piece at a time, braced off of the existing. And, but then he proposed to erect the suspended span, east anchor arm, and through truss span in a method that he called span by span erection. Now this is a graphic of the proposed scheme. This was developed by HNTB, which served as the contractor's uh, construction engineers. And what they proposed to do was to um, ere erect the two widening trusses sections. These are approximately 530 feet long, complete against a stabilizing frame. Both frame and truss would be floated out into position, lifted up onto the structure. Once the existing, the widening trusses were stabilized against the existing, then that stability frame would be lowered back down to the barge, brought back over and reused for another lift. These became known as the big lifts, and uh, these are quite impressive to see. Here are some photographs from the first lift. This would be for the east anchor arm. This is the widening frame. Uh, prepared and ready to receive uh, truss members, and we see here the beginning uh, erection of the widening trusses. Then on a Friday afternoon before a weekend closure of the highway traffic, it was floated into position, and yeah, it looks kind of dark and stormy here, and it was. They said a huge storm just went, went around the site uh, uh, while they were shifting this thing into position. Uh, now, traffic was supposed to be kept uh, to a minimum of interruptions. Now, to shut it down for a whole weekend is certainly not a minimum. But this was very agreeable to the public because this was sort of like getting it all over with at one time, rather than a, you know the death of a thousand cuts where you would do these individual uh, uh, closures as as you erect each individual member. Here, the uh, the span is ready to be lifted. Uh, Mammut was the subcontractor for this lift. And then here we see it going up. Total lifting weight was 2,750 tons. Once lifted up, it was, uh, and, and what you don't realize, it has to be lifted up outside the piers, then drawn in, 
and then set on the on the uh, piers, and then once stabilized against the existing truss, the stability frames were lowered down on a Monday morning uh, with rush hour traffic going by. Finally, the approaches. The challenges here was uh, most of the approaches are pre-stressed concrete girders, sheer volume. Uh, there's a large number of them, and there were a large number of individual designs because of curvature, because the bents were locations were dictated by the uh, steel trestles supporting the railroad, and, for, and at grade roadways. We also had to solve the problem of as we approach the main bridge, there's a conflict between the widening roadways and the uh, existing. And then finally, how do you detail columns? Because as they get higher, you have to make them larger. And how do you keep that efficient in terms of its detailing? Now, this is the west approach. The abutments start about here. They pass through this intersection where ramps come up and on and off Bridge City Avenue. They go into a curvature. And then at this, at this point, they shift to uh, five-span continuous steel girders about 1,000 feet long. And it's in this area that you have start having the conflicts. On the East Bank side, there's again another 1,000 foot five span continuous steel girders. And again, conflict. We come down and there's on and off ramps to Jefferson Highway. The one main line continues on here, but the East Bank bound main line has to pass through the railroad trestle at the East Bank railroad modifications. And everything terminates here at a street called Mounds. As I said, the pre-stress girders was one of the, the, the sheer volume of designs. We had, uh, for type three girders, 57, almost 57,000 lineal feet. Type fours, almost 5,000. BT 78s, almost 33,000. For a total of almost 18 miles of pre-stress girders in the, in the contract plans. Uh, in terms, again, because of curvature, because of bents being forced to be at certain locations, we ended up with 263 individual Type 3 girder designs, 127 Type 4s, 182 BT 78s. Some of these were high performance concrete spans uh, with span lengths of 150 feet. There's a total of 572 pre stressed girder designs. We used Bentley Leap Conspan for this. It greatly sped up the process, uh, particularly since also in the final design phase, the uh, owner wanted to have the project accelerated and took a year off the design time. Uh, also, it was, this program was useful because when we had to sometimes adjust a bent location, we had to redesign girders, and this could be updated very quickly. The substructures are reinforced concrete columns. Uh, supported on H-pile foundations. This picture shows the solution for that conflict between the existing roadways. We introduced a construction joint in the cap as well as the superstructure. And then after this existing roadway is demolished, then the remainder could be constructed. Finally, the details for the uh, columns. Uh, most of the columns, fortunately, are this smaller size, so right away you get a lot of efficiency. But as you approach the main bridge and they get taller, the column sizes have to get larger as well. What we did to keep the design and, and the detail simple and efficient, this curvature is the same on all of these girders, and this rustification detail is the exact same detail in all. So the only thing left is, is a change in the column size, and all of these changes are simple formwork changes that don't have any real cost penalty. So where is the project today? Well, at the end of October, this is what the main span looked like. And compare that with some of the original photograph. Taking a quick tour, driving tour from the East Bank to the West Bank, uh, this is the West Bank bound on the East Bank side. And, and this is going to get really twisted around when you try to keep your bounds and sides straight. Uh, East Bank side, West Bank bound, Main Line. It's not finished yet, uh, so traffic uses the ramps from Jefferson Highway to get across the main span. This is the uh, East Bank Railroad modifications. You'll get a better view of that shortly. Driving over to the West Bank side, the deck on the other side of the temporary barrier is almost finished. And uh, I should say it is finished, and they're almost finished with the barriers. Um, on the West Bank side, the West Bank main line is not open. You have to get off at Bridge City Avenue and use the at-grade roadways. Going all the way down to the West Bank railroad modifications and making a U-turn and coming back, East Bank bound, West Bank side is still under construction. But the East Bank on the East, East Bank bound and East Bank side is in use. And we're pat you actually drive through now the East Bank railroad modifications. 
I want to conclude by acknowledging that uh, some of the photographs were who they were provided by. I also want to acknowledge my team members at Majeski and Masters. We spent many years uh, designing everything that you see here. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that this has been a very, very successful project, and is it due in no small part to many talented people from the contractors and even subcontractors not listed here. And I finally, I want to thank Bentley for inviting us to be here as a finalist. So with that, uh, I'll close and uh, take any questions. Yeah, did you find that you had to do any rehabilitation of the existing structure? before the, you actually got started with any of this? No, the bridge has been kept in excellent condition uh, by the New Orleans Public Belt. It's its primary asset. And uh, in fact, when um, uh, you know, I-35 failed and a lot of communities were saying, gee, how, how bad are our bridges? And, and, and well, the local paper asked that question. And they were shocked to report that this bridge was one of the best bridges in the whole state uh, because it has been kept in excellent condition. As to lead in on that question, that was kind of close to my question. Were there any code requirements once you, you know, adjusted on the existing bridge that you had to do to, you know, when you took the pier over? Was there any updating of the structure because of the code requirements? The, the, the new, all the new construction was based on, um, like I say, sort of a combination of Arima and Ashto. We designed it to both codes. Uh, uh, and, and made sure the members met that. And obviously, we evaluated anything we didn't change. Thanks. The, the original foundations, you say they were, um, they were capable of supporting the new load. Did that surprise you? Uh, there's, I mean, there's an awful lot more on those additional foundations. Do you have to do... They, what were your, your contingencies? Yeah, well, one of the interesting side notes is Carl Terzaghi, for your engineers who recognize the name, he actually did the soil work on this bridge. Uh, one of the advantages you have when you work with an existing structure, if you have a new construction, all you do is set, send a, you know, take some borings and, and kind of guess a little bit. They did do some new borings to get some new lab values. But one of the advantages you have, this is a caisson. It's called an open dredge well caisson. And that means that when it was sunk, they were digging the material out of the wells as it sunk. There is an accurate record of exactly what is down there on the, underneath each of those open dredge wells under each one of these caissons. Thank you.